maybe that was my fault first girl. I, I, I dropped the mic accidentally before I came out. I was just saying I was about to kind of skip up here to come and forward to step up over there. But then we remember at 54 you can't skip as you like. <laughs> so um thank you for having me. I um I find it very interesting that I was asked to share. I'm not a pastor, but I think I could be a decent teacher. I've done a lot of that for um, part of my life. And I am pleased to say I've taught from infants to age so I think I have a good idea as to um, how to share. Because I don't have a man not the pastor, you know. <laughs> Um, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we bless you. We thank you. You're a good God. Thank you for all your people. Thank you, O oh God, for your blessings upon us. Thank you that you are God and you sit above the circle of God with all power in your hands. I thank you today that you do not serve a weak God. I thank you that you are God is great. That you are strong. You are Jehovah the Son, our God of war. You sang songs of war this morning. Lord, help us not to just sing and get emotional, but to truly believe that God is strong. He is the strongest. He is the greatest. He is the almighty. He is our God, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. I thank you, O oh God, that we do not have to bow down to stones and to other things this morning. But at the same time, we do not preach in stone's will. I thank you, O oh God, that you are the God of life. And I thank you this morning that your people are going to be blessed because I want to diminish and I want you to really take full authority. And be, O oh God, the one who speaks this morning. I do not want to be the one who will remember, be remembered for this. I want you to be remembered for what you are going to say to your Father, bless us all in Jesus' name. Amen. I was speaking with Desiree, my daughter, um, maybe that two weeks ago, and I was saying, what is really meant by let us not be earthly minded but heavenly minded? What is truly the same? So you see, when you call Daniel and ask him the same, I'm saying what? I was just doing this research. Then, some months ago, somebody prophesied and said, I was called to hold down strongholds. And people teach me the weapons that I should use. So, I said, okay. So I started studying strongholds, mindset, so you see the connection, setting your mind on whatever things. Recognizing and putting down strongholds, which are which mindsets and feelings. But these things are coming together and it's a massive place and already in the thing. But some people are telling me, is this a second record for you? Um, you know, maybe you should call and say you can make it. Maybe you should say no. And I'm telling you, many times I want to tell that girl, I'm here. But I think all along, God was saying, you know, you have to be disregarded so many people. Because at one time I said, oh, it's too late to tell you no now. So then he called and said, well, it won't be the first day I gave you, it's going to be later. I said, oh, everything I thought about seemed to be falling apart, so I really need to do this. I'm really full this morning, really full. Full because I'm wondering how I'll do justice to all the things that are in my, my heart to see. Because you can plan, and I, I teach public speaking, you can plan the best thing, there is something about me and Yes. When he takes over, forget about the stuff. He's going to plan, go to prepare. But I belong to give him room. This morning while I was singing, he was teaching me about creation and saying, Oh God, look at how to present. Why is he teaching me about creation? No. But I always say, and I want to always mean it, he has permission to interrupt my life. So I want to not stick to exactly the theme you gave me. I want to use the same scripture 
but I do not want to use the same topic, which is the same focus and engagement in poverty crisis. I want to deal with a lot of stuff, and I don't think I could have accomplished it in, in the time. So I chose something that is sort of all encompassing, and I hope you're ready to be blessed by it. Can I just see the hands of those who will be returning to school at any level, primary, secondary? Possibility of school too? God bless you. You have to excel and show them what God does in this school. Thank you very much. Because I want my message to be relevant and I really want to reach people who are most poised to you know, benefit from it. I, I, I like to study the mind. I like to see how far it can take me, how far it can go. Some things God will never show us until our minds are in the right place. Yeah. I think about how much I thought I knew and I thought I was walking with God and He showed me some things these days and I'm like, what? Is that for real? That happens? But I couldn't receive it before now. So it is good to really try and walk your way. That's why he says, study, study, study. Because there are things he cannot reveal to you and us until we get to that place. Maybe I should have gotten to that place a long time ago. I don't know. Maybe I was slow. But I'm just saying, wherever you are, walk on it. Walk out. So thank you for the invitation. Scripture says that we're looking at today, it was taken from, it's taken from uh, Colossians 3.2. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. The first thing I thought of is, well, how would we set our minds only on heavenly things that we live in down here? Aren't we earthly to an extent? We are eternal, we belong to the kingdom, but we are in the world, although we are not of the world. And I'm saying, this sounds like a little contradiction. But the more... Built to outlast our storms. Oh, yes. Built to outlast our rejection. Yeah. We 
we are built to others because what we do most of the times is give others permission to reject us. Mm -hmm. Because we are who he says we are. Mm -hmm. But we sometimes feel we are what others say because they hurt us because we either love the people or we trust them. And when they do some things, we really feel bad. And maybe women more than men. I don't know, they say men are not so sensitive, I know that. I think men are more sensitive than they want to tell us. And in the secret of their own place and, and they, 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 they experience their own pain. I'm not looking at any man right now. <laughs> I believe that they have their own pain, but society and so uh, you know, taught them how to kind of put it on the back burner or pretend it doesn't exist. Or work to the bones and go to sleep tired so they don't have to think about it. So, we all have our issues to deal with, and it's interesting that it all comes back to the mind. Let's look at heavenly things and earthly things. First Corinthians 1 20 speaks of the wisdom of the world. There's one kind of understanding of earthly things and another of heavenly things. Earthly things are those things that do not pertain to God or His kingdom. These things may include government, household management, mechanical skills, the liberal arts and the sciences. Among the heavenly things are the pure knowledge of God, the nature of true righteousness, and the mysteries of the kingdom. I'm not saying that God, you know, I find scripture very interesting and, and living for God very interesting. Sometimes I say, but God, how you can say? And I know there's a particular pastor I like to listen to him and he would say, he would say um, pray for God to send destiny help us for you. Pray for him to give you a favor with men. And I like to hear that. But then I say, how do you reconcile that with they will hate you because they hated me? How do you reconcile the two truths because they are truths? So I sometimes say there is a time for everything and I put that scripture in between there. Because there's a time when man will come to your assistance and God will use a man every time he wants to do something. But we can't forget that they also hate us because they hated Christ first. So it is about balance, and that is something that I struggle with sometimes as a Christian. I try to see how does this thing balance with that. And I thought that some of my teachers don't spend a lot of time bringing the balance. Because you wonder how some scripture will line up with something that is being really said. So I like when they look at the whole thing. Look at the whole picture and so say, well, you might hear so and so, but this is where you get meaning from the steps. So, the wisdom of the world in Colossians 1.20, Paul refers to this wisdom. His use of the distinction between knowledge of earthly and heavenly things helps us understand how learning from the knowledge of unbelievers in some areas does not continue immediately to the wisdom of the world. So I'm trying to bring some balance here. I remember um, Tim Jakes had invited Oprah Winfrey to one of his conferences, Women Woman that were used. And he just said, why would he bring a sinner as Oprah in this conference? that are supposed to be general for believers and what can we bring to a spiritual gathering. And I remember him defending it and saying, don't you know how to eat the meat and spit on the board? Because actually the second time I call that pastor, I see that. He seemed to be coming in Christian service. So he said he went to our studios and he found such excellence in production technology. I, I had a current television. And we had a little pretty good station called GBC at the time of GBM. And we used to do news and the tape getting chewed up and I took it back and start again. That time news was not live. So when I left television news became just before I left, they started to go live. And it was really a horror getting a news class. I like what I did. I love the job. When I think about somebody like the who has so much to do with television production. She is so great in the field. Number one in the world in many things. But 
the important thing is you line up with her because she has knowledge of these things and great tools and great equipment and so on. You know what she tries to say that? But he's saying it doesn't prevent you from learning. Learning is not good or bad except what the source is. So for example, if a blessing is from the dark side, you're not going for a blessing, but you can take knowledge from it. She has her own Bible, right? She does. She does. And she also believes that there are many parts of the world. So will you take counsel there? No. But you can take knowledge. So just so that we don't confuse not taking anything of this world because it is of no heavenly value. Because we still have to live here and we still need knowledge to live here. Yeah. Whatever knowledge unbelievers have of earthly things is ultimately vain if not grounded in Christian faith. It may be true what they know, but it does not go far enough. Paul is not condemning man's reasoning or his ability to understand earthly things. He is declaring that all of this is of no avail without acquiring spiritual wisdom. All of scripture assumes that man's reason retains some functionality after the fall. But you know, God brought all the animals to Adam. I mean, I'm blown away by that. And Adam named every one of them. And God supervised him to see what he would call them. And he did well. Man was born with great intelligence. Amen. You see why you have to keep out evolution? Man did not start as caveman and come up and come up and come up until he reached a level of intelligence today. He was born made, sorry, intelligent. Yes. Adam was born made, right, as you know. He was made as a man, but Adam had such intelligence. Sometimes I say, why didn't he see what the snake was made of when he named it? So that when he came back to do a thing with Eve, he could have said, I named him, I know his potential. I just wanted that, I didn't see that anyway, I just wanted when he was named the snake. When the snake was a majestic animal, scripture says to us, it was a, a, a beautiful thing, it wasn't dragging on his belly and so on, it was a majestic thing. So, whatever happened there happened, but um, Adam was wise, Adam was intelligent. So with the fall, I don't know if man retained all that level of intelligence, but he certainly retained a lot because he is still made in the image of God. All of scripture, as I say, assumes that man's reason some of it was retained, his functionality was retained, maybe his excellence, some of it was curtailed. He can learn to cook, farm, build, govern by accurate observation of the world. Jesus himself pointed to the ability of unbelievers to properly understand something about the natural world. In his controversy with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you remember, he said, When it's evening, you say, it will be fair weather but the sky is red. And in the morning you say, it will be stormy to me, but the sky is red and threatening. What do you say? If you know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, why can't you interpret the signs of the times? Who do we know in scripture and know how to figure out the times? The sun's up, the second, the second. Why wasn't this the, the scribes and the Pharisees able to do that? I mean, Pastor, do you mind if I make them interactive? No? Okay. I really want us to kind of share. Really share. Why do you think they couldn't figure out the times? Even if they would look at the sky. Your grandparents could have done it. My grandmother could do that. She would have said, take out the maze there eh, from outside because rain will come. Take the mace inside, don't let it wait. She knew, 
just as the Pharisees and the and, 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 and she knew. Any answers to why you think they couldn't discern the times? Okay, because it is spiritually discerned. And they didn't have the spiritual eyes that they needed to have. So they can do what they observe, they can look out and see things. A scientist can look into his whatever he uses and know what is happening in a person's body in terms of what what um, pathogens they have, you know, um, whoever, oncologists or whoever will take a biopsy setting somewhere and somebody could look and say, yes, this are the markers here that person has cancer. You know, and, and that's great. That's great. So that's the knowledge of man. What happens after that is largely up to God. Doctors can do some and how much I, I, I love doctors, I, I believe in doctors, but there's a limit to what they can do. Yeah. And there's yeah. a limit to also what they can do. Unbelievers can come to some knowledge of other things from observing God's creation. When it comes to the knowledge of heavenly things, however, unbelievers scripture tells us blind. For example, it says, the message of the cross is foolishness. For who? But for those who know God, it is what? The power of God of salvation. So, you know, we have different eyes. Some eyes, we think people should see, but they are actually blind. I even found a very strange scripture. When Saul was struck down. It's interesting. Before his eyes were closed, he was blind. Read it. He couldn't see, but his eyes were open for a time. So to set one's mind on something refers to where one's mind is grounded. What we are told to be rooted, grounded, and established in Christ. That's where we're supposed to fix our thoughts. So whereas children of God set our minds on the things of God and his kingdom, in, in fact, it is our fixation on things of God that truly matters and brings us victory in all areas of this life. So if you, it's interesting what the kingdom of God looks like. Right? If you want to, he says, some, he says the way up is what? Down. He says the greatest self among you is the, do you understand that kind of teaching? It seems to go contrary to what you, you know. If you're on the job and you want a promotion, you work hard, you study, you go to you, you go to SGU, you apply online, you do yourself, come back and tell your boss, hey, I just have a degree and um, on the basis of a meritorious award, I, I, I am entitled to a promotion, I'm entitled to a raise of pay. And that is, that is, that is what happens in the office system. I'm not condemning, I'm just saying, God says that you want to achieve something but it's not necessarily the way you choose to go about it in the kingdom. For example, I know somebody wants to have an assignment to you, and there was a, a meeting, a, a meeting that she felt she should have gone to a crusade, and she didn't want to go because she had an assignment, and it was a crucial assignment. Afterwards, she felt she was just being pushed to, 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 to go to the thing, no time for the assignment. So she did something kind of, um, busy and presenting. A lecturer said, you got the highest mark because nobody else understood the assignment. Mm -hmm. What does that happen? I'm not saying your assignments and one is going to be greater. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, there's a way God rewards us for honoring him. Amen. Amen. There's a way he gives us, and you know, don't ever underestimate the trouble some of us might be going through right now. God never be such trouble. Amen. But a lot of what we go through is dealt with by the mind. It's dealt with by the mind. And that is why the message to the people going back to school and to us in general 
is to really guard your mind. I don't know if it happens to you, but someone is to get up and you're hearing this thing I'm hoping, that thing I'm hoping, and we're wanting to do this for. And you, you get all of those voices saying to you, well, I tell you to get, get up a bit this morning because this thing has a very to go wrong. And if you guard the lines of your mind and say, no, it is a productive day. The Bible says, a lazy man says, I'm not going out today because I lie so sad is going to eat me. I mean, this is some of as a nasty story. It's some of something that you wouldn't find in the Bible, but it's true. He's not going out to work because it's a lion or sad and I mean, do people think like that? It's actually there. So sometimes the pressures of life make people don't even want to get up, not even to step up. But we are more than that. We are more than that because we have a mind that we can control. Years ago, a lady had an accident. Well, she had children in her truck, a little pickup truck. That's what she drove in her business. And there was another person who had a truck like that. The same place, her truck was almost banged up, but it was not a new truck. The other person's truck kind of looked really, really similar, almost the same age and so on. So that person's vehicle, uh, I don't know if you might remember, a wall fell on that vehicle in St. Andrews, and the person died. After that, the street was going all over fixing walls because they were falling and they were in the So when people heard about this guy, this person in this truck who died, but they thought it was her. So they were calling her and asking, oh, what's going on? And she said, why do you think it was me? You know? Because they said, well, look, the vehicle is the same and so on, so on, so on. So they thought, you know, we just called to make sure. And then she started to tell me, Lord, that come up in me. You see her over there? And people think it was me that there, and she just had to get really broken and trying to figure out why are you getting sad and think about it. No, it's not you. But I realized that's how the mind sometimes goes. You do the thing already, you overcome, you're not even involved, or you, you were in a situation and you were, you were scared, but you start worrying, boy. You see how people that are not me down, boy. You see how they get all over just so. And then you start thinking, thinking, and then you, you, you get scared to go into a mouth. Because you might be walking, and that could happen, and it may happen to you yesterday. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. These things can happen. Because the mind. Who is putting these thoughts in your mind? They're not accidental, you know. The thoughts that you have, as my late husband would say, sometimes they are thoughts that think you. It does not make sense to you because some kind of odd, but you think about it, it's pretty real. He says some thoughts think you. You don't think them. They're pushed into your mind and you are saying something. Where did that come from? I don't I, you know. I didn't think of that. I never had that in my mind. It's important to guard your mind. I also find that as young believers, there is a tendency, maybe culturally, and that's something I want to deal with a little bit more now, how culture influences how we think. Young people seem to always have this banner. I have time. I'm young. You see how I say I'm 54, but you know, I'm 54 next time. But you see how I say that? I'm sure some of say, what, she old boy? <laughs> because you get the feeling when you're young that you will never get old. And anybody who is 40, how she old boy? You know, it's just it's just a way to think when you're young. but. You are not required to leave anything your mind is concerned until you get away. You have to take control of your mind, your thoughts, right now. I looked at a, little, a young girl yesterday on um, status for WhatsApp, I think it was. And I was just looking at how they put things out and, you know, dress in a certain way. And, and I am checking. I'm checking how that thing is happening. You start with it. You put out a little piece of breast. Next week, you put out a little piece of leg. Following week, you put out more breast. And it's going on. You realize there is something happening in the mind, eh? And that thing is driving her and driving her again. Driving, 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 until it gets to a point where you have no restraint anymore. I know 
for high school, like you teach me in high school. High school, I had to ask the girls to take t shirts to go on, 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 on um, Zoom. Because when they are in classes, their breasts hanging over in the camera. So the teachers can, and whoever else can see. What makes a girl want to bear her body young? Where does it lead? It always leads to the same place. Abuse, disregard, regret, it always leads to the same thing. There is no other way. Why, why, why is there this, this, this desire to, to show it off all? There's nothing to the imagination. I went to a um, pastor KFC one day, and I saw some girls, some very school girls, and they come out as a group. Short is short of, I mean, I don't know why I wear shorts too. I went to university, I don't have to tell you to wear shorts. And I was not a big but I'm just looking at what is happening, and I'm thinking, but these shots are come to town, so short. And they come as a group. They don't always dress like that sometimes in the Maybe their parents do not But sometimes they get to somewhere and they share some money or clothing or whatever. And the thing is, they don't understand that what is going to happen is always going to be because they think that it's just a, a thing that we're doing now because they have time, they can change this and then change it. We, we don't know how much time we have, whether we're young or whether we're old. And that is why if you have influence over children, and you have influence over, or if you know parents as well, you must feel bad to, to, to help a parent and say, I know this is your daughter dressing a little, kind of, um, you know? Um, revealing. Maybe you could talk to Lord in it. I mean, if you tell them in a way that is not offensive right, and, and you truly care, I think they will pick up and, and, and maybe know because some people don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's just part in the data and you want to kind of, you know. But we know that when kids are young, they have very little, very little will. I was speaking to Ali one day. Ali said to me, her car was broken down, and she went on a bus. And as soon as she entered the bus, she felt the spirit sex demon in the bus. Don't tell me these kids are just all doing things on their own. You want to know where they're going, bus drivers and conductors? The spirit is right there. They are led, they are drawn, and then what you see is a manifestation of what is bothering them. So we have to pray for young people, and young people need to pray for themselves because it is not like our God to deny you what you are asking for. The Lord said in the scripture, if you pray, he will answer. If there is a man to pray, there is a God to answer. Amen. And he has not changed. He has not changed. You can go to him and say, God, I don't like what I'm feeling in my body. I don't like what I'm feeling. Help me. He gave you your hormones, but he also gave you the spirit to control them. Amen. So, you know, come to him. He already knows what you are experiencing, and he knows the demons you are facing. He knows. Sometimes they come in families. Sometimes they are from other, other, you know, sources. But there is a target on our young people because obviously we have a future. You are the leaders that are coming up. The next generation is you. You see why the enemy is so hard on you? You see why you have to not let it mess with your mind? And your mind is a terrible thing to waste. People who experience failure because of the, 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 the lack of mindset to hold things together, they didn't just start off bad. They probably just didn't have any help. So I hope that what we're learning here will help somebody to set their mind in a in the place where it should be so that they can overcome. Because you know the enemy is not after anything else but your mind. Well your time to but your mind. If he has your mind, he has you. As a man thinketh in his heart, and heart here really means mind. So is he. If you think you're a failure, 
that's what you're going to move towards. And those spirits of failure will be sure to come around you and say, you know what things are. You know they didn't do good. You follow them, you know what they didn't do good. You, you just meant to go in the road. That's all you do. And if you just keep going under that kind of pressure, it's in truth to know what you do. In truth, that is what. But God takes us from wherever we are and shoots us up to excellence regardless Amen. of our circumstances because we can walk with him. We have the mind of Christ, scripture says. We have the mind of Christ. But sometimes we're afraid to exercise it. Sometimes we say we are more than conquerors in Christ. We are more than. And we say it later. And I wonder sometimes if we really feel that or we feel God. You say I'm a conqueror, but you say this about me, but I think the biggest challenge is to internalize what we say. So when I teach, sometimes in businesses and so, I like to do a little repetition. Teachers who are here with I like to kind of say it again and again because somehow it gets in brain when you hear it again and again. So if nobody is there to tell you, you have to tell yourself the thing again and again and again until you turn the life and it becomes one with you. Because you know in this life, even if you're young, you won't have people to help you all the time. You go to school, you have to make your own decisions. And parents, please help them to make decisions when they're, when they're old. Small decisions that wouldn't matter if they even go wrong. But teach them to make decisions and to live with them. Small things. I told my son the other day, I told him to make this. I said, go and make bakes for breakfast. He started, he was doing, okay, I was upstairs, I never went down, to help him. And then he came up and was crying. I do something wrong, he was 16. I do something wrong, I said, what? I don't know, you need to know. I said, you know what you grow up, I said, that's great. Go and see what you're doing downstairs. She was just saying, no, he didn't go and he makes cup of bread, he put salt, he put clay and water and things, and it feels soft and nice. I don't know what you're worried about. I went downstairs and I looked at the thing. The thing was good. But in, in my mind, I already said, what do you spoil it for? <laughs> they will eat what they make. <laughs> they just eat it, or if you can't eat it too bad. But what he told me, Mommy, I'm getting two bones of flour. I said, oh gosh, not that. <laughs> Why do you need two bones? I went two bones too much. But the thing was so good and you roasted it in the, on the hot pot. And the thing was really good. But it took a bit of encouragement to tell him, go ahead and do it, go ahead and try it. I didn't mind if I had to two pounds of flour to be honest, eh? I hope you play it. But I figured if it's two pounds of flour it's going to take for him to learn to make bakes, he could have to take that risk. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes we have to, you know, bend a little bit so that they can make decisions. Decisions that won't kill them if they go wrong. And be there to support even if it goes wrong. Um, when they come to make bigger decisions, they would have had confidence in making small ones. So you just don't give them a chance to just make a big decision all of a sudden. And then they never really got the chance to make the little ones along the way. So I don't know about there. That was not time. Um, <laughs> Thank you. First Corinthians 1.20 says, where, that's very interesting, where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? You see why you can't take the wisdom of the world? God has made it foolish. It is of no value in terms of its, its essence to the child of God. He himself has made it foolish. Is that strange scripture? That is why wisdom doesn't come with where you come from or any such thing. Because who is the giver of all wisdom? It's God Himself. It's God Himself. So He says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask. And what does he give? How much he gives them? Generously. Liberally, generously. So you ask and he gives. But he says to in scripture, he have not. Because, 
because you ask not. I felt a real simple. Ask, he gives. Ask, he gives. Especially when you ask, of course, within the framework of his will. When something is in God's will, you don't have to ask if it's right. Maybe it might be your answer is not no. But he will not refuse your prayer. Sometimes I learn a lot about answering prayer through this dream, my daughter, because she was able to see some things. And I'm praying for this. Like one day I was driving and I missed three or four accidents. And I mean, I know I'm not a British driver, but I don't think this accident should have been so close to me at all because I was already on my side. And I said, let me pray because this is not normal between Miriam and Malibra, four near accidents. So I said, in the name of Jesus, I cause this demon spirits around me to leave me now. And she says to me, I see, I see, um, I think it was it arms without, without head. I see them tampering with stuff. So I said, well, you're in the head? Well, I send a bomb of God against you, though. She said, oh, gosh, mommy, my shot. <laughs> I couldn't see it. I couldn't see it. But I had demonic interference right in my car. Right there. Don't think you above these things now. But thank God, I get a little scrape in the last place I had to pass. It was so tight. My mirror scrape. And I had to... We had $500 to fix it, but it was, <laughs> and I had to get it from our own, our own model, people like mine, I mean, I couldn't get it in the, in the shop, so I had to buy that thing, the mirror couldn't turn anymore, so I had to do that, but I thank God that it was just that, it could have been a lot worse, and with that man coming, I don't know, oh yes, but you know, including the big plum tree that coming in the room that I can't pass. <laughs> You know, so these are the things sometimes we go through and we think, well, it's just a, co a coincidence. You know, in the Jewish Bible, there is no word coincidence. There is no such word. It does not exist in the list of words. It doesn't exist in the culture because they believe everything is at the hand of God. So nothing just happens. We have a lot of words for coincidence in the English dictionary, a lot. Because we believe that things just happen. We know that it is not so. Especially for the child of God, all things work together for good. Sometimes I go through things and I say, where is it good in this, God? Where is it good in this? Wait. Wait. I see 14 on the front here. And I was just remembered. I had 14 years with my husband before he died, but he gave me three beautiful kids to raise, and I see him in every one of them. And I thank God for my 14 years. Pastor, thank God for your 14 years. We yeah, have many, many, many more, right. because I have many more in those three kids. Yeah, I really thank him for so much that he's taken me through and the fact that he has kept my mind. So when I tell you about your mind, I am joking, you know. I know what the power of the mind can do. There is a law of the mind that no matter what you go through, you cannot be overtaken. The people under Nimrod Kush who started to build the temple, the tower, what did God say about them, about their mind? Anything they put their mind to, they would accomplish. And these were, these were not godly people, you know. These are not godly people. He said they could accomplish what they put their mind to. So there is a power of the mind, even outside of God. But it is not advisable to have the power that is void of God because it will only go so far and more. So I find it interesting in thinking about what do we do to not be earthly minded? And I remember that scripture. Finally, brethren, that's um, Philippians 4 8. Whatsoever is true, 
whatsoever is noble, whatsoever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. I know different versions have been termed differently. I think one, this one is a new international version. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. I know that all the things he spoke about, what is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable. If anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about such things. So it may be one day something is true, but it is not praiseworthy. Should you think about it? It is a fact that you see a man just beat up his life and throw in a dream. That is a fact. It is true. Is that one of the things you should be thinking about? No. Except to pray that that man and that woman make it somehow to change things and live well and ask the Lord to help them. Or pull up in it from a dream if you can. But that is not praiseworthy. It is not excellent. So you don't think about it. To the point where that is made of nine mistakes. Maybe this is not the best example, but I'm just saying. It's a good one. <laughs> I'm just saying, if there is nothing praiseworthy about truth, don't fix your mind there. Because some truths are not good truths. That's true. And that's true. <laughs> so don't think about it. Whatever it is that draws you into a place where you can be blessed, you can benefit from it, you can, it can do something for you and the kingdom, you think about it because what happens when you think about your problems? Anything you think about magnifies. You start thinking about how that person treats you. And then you remember, but oh wait, she mother the pastor look at me funny too, you know. So she mother begs with me too. And what are these people? Well look, she and fast no one has she face time. And that's how we go, you know. By the end of the week, what was just your friend in that family? Seem to have a problem with you. Spread to include the whole generation. And then you start to feel really, really dumb. A woman was speaking of it one time, she was in the gym, and this person always would have the position next to her on the treadmill. And she said that woman just ate her, she don't know why. And one day she had some problem and she had to leave the gym, and this woman came and somebody talked to me, crying or whatever, and said, I'm so sorry, but you know, whatever it is. She said, hey, the woman who ate me, Tell me that. The woman didn't even know the woman. <laughs> the person next to her had no clue, had no hate, had no nothing. But she says something about a woman, she just knew she hated her. And it was nothing like that. Suspicion. Just a suspicion. And then everything that woman does would have been ready in a certain way. Yeah? If she turns her back so, then she thinks she's better than me. <laughs> You know, if she looks straight ahead, then she don't want to see me on the side there. Eh? You see what, what the mindset does, eh? I mean, you're laughing and true, but these are things we sometimes... No, oh, it's a day, I'm waiting for you to give it a drop. Okay, and I saw... <laughs> I saw a woman and a child being dropped off by her boats by the public station in, um, in the by by Queen's Park. I was staying out there. No, I never knew there was a jetty there. I mean, I walked in Grand Lake, I know that that's where the boat comes in to pump the oil so they go through the thing and go to, uh, to the power station. But somehow, I didn't think there was a set of steps you can come from the sea. So I see this boat come there and drop a woman and a child. And I hear her say, What are you watching this over? <laughs> I 
and maybe was not observed because I probably wasn't watching my shoes, but not really called. I'm looking at the whole pro process. So she got married. So sometimes we can do that when our mind, and then sometimes we know what maybe maybe she should not have been that guy who dropped her there. And she's thinking about somebody see you dropping her or maybe all kind of things going on there. But I don't know that. So sometimes you can make assumptions about people and what you're thinking because you might be so wrong, so off. So I want to talk a little bit about the love. Is everybody I making mean, sense? Yeah. Okay. If there's anything you want to ask, if I can answer, I'd really be happy to do it, especially the younger ones, because I want this thing to be so practical to you that you must not wonder how can I think about the other things. I want to sound like an old phony Bible quoting um, Christian that should be stupid and um, one good thing I could talk about is the Bible. My son had an issue then, not his son. He used to be very concerned about looking as a stupid Christian. His friends in school told him that they have no respect for Christianity. They don't like it. They think it's a poorly kind of um, attachment and Christians basically don't have any sense. And his biggest thing about um, something that was happening in his life and, and we were working on it and, and he was really being restored in the Lord. He said, Mommy, I, I really want to serve God because, and I can tell you this, he kind of lost his faith when his father died. And that kind of drove him away. Like he put God in the box and put him in the closet. So he would do the things that we do, but um, his real commitment was not there. But he had a little experience in his life and that really brought it back because he realized that this is what we do. So he said, my biggest thing now is going to school and thinking about looking like a nerd, a Christian nerd, fanatic. And I say, I look as a Christian nerd to you. <laughs> I look as a fanatic yeah. to you. No, no. I, I mean, I think so. <laughs> so. So I say, boy, no, you don't have to be like that at all. I say, but when you go to school and you see something that you're not, that not supposed to happen, you have to say, I review that. It's not about sowing more in your nothing. It's about having the word in you and the anointing to break things that are happening right around you. When there's fighting GBSs, there's a clarion call. Oh, right! Everybody comes. You know the video game? They think and they say, fight, fight. Oh yeah, GBSs is, oh, you fight, come. Everybody come together, not to stop it, but to wear eyes, to enjoy it, and to, oh gosh, they even punch in the head. They, they, they do that. I say, amen. When you come and you see that going on, you don't have to say a word of God. Call on the power of your God to so bring down this thing. Amen. Yes, because you see, there are a lot of militants in our school, and school, school people are getting to reality. Every school has a spirit, I've known of them. Yeah. Every school has spirits, and you have to be able to deal with them and take them down. Because you are the light in the schools, not the other people. Even the teachers who are not saying you're not right. So you have a responsibility to create an environment in your school where you can work, where you can function. You have to take authority there. There's a spirit of lesbianism in high school. There's a spirit of homosexuality in GBSS. You think the people who are in school just want to be doing these things? Even in the toilets? You think they want to be doing these things? They are open doors. The enemies. The enemy will So I know people who go to high school and, and, and give a um, religious education. And they actually call the girls lesbian. Get up from sit down right there, all your lesbian. And they went to teach them religious education. And they call it that. When you call a thing a thing, what do you think happens to it? It is a profession you're making over it. It's like a curse. So when you send your kids to Break the powers that are existing Amen. in that environment. Amen. Amen. I pray over the schools a lot. I pray over them. I see in our schools, and I'm not telling anybody to break the rules. I see in our schools, it is more important to respect the uniform than the child. Boy, this is so-and-so school. Fix the shirt. Fix the this. Fix the that. You know, remember you're wearing the uniform. Almost like a military establishment. There is a spirit of militancy in all of those schools. There's a spirit of militancy there. I feel it all the time. 
the boys ought to be faithful to the uniform. It's not to the principles. It's not to what's supposed to guide their lives. It's about the uniform. In, that's how they, they do it in the army, no? Yep. So, pray over your girls. Pray over your boys. The poet schools have their issues. Hmm. The single head schools have their issues. They all have issues. But, a lot of the issues are common. A lot of the issues are common in, 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 in those kinds of schools. And we have to pray when our kids are going there. We have to pray. We cannot just leave them up. You know, I have something that bothers me about school. Too many young, young girls teaching in our secondary school. The boys too, but the girls. You just leave college, never manage a classroom in your life. When I was a young teacher and I started to teach at 17, somebody bought me a little book called And So to Teach. I had to learn to teach. I was just being taught myself. I have no experience. Let me tell you something. A lot of young kids going to school managing on the education they went there with, you know. A lot of them are not learning in their learning environment, you know. And it's not to condemn anybody. I'm just saying, and as a young teacher too, I'm just saying, if you are a young teacher, learn how to teach on your own if you get a job. There used to be a thing PRG used to do when I was a very young teacher. They used to give us kids some training. So because you want to train in teacher's college and, and get a full certificate, they trained you on the job. Every Friday you went to teacher's college and you had classes. So I was trained eventually before I left teaching. But when you go there, one of my greatest problems in, in, in secondary school, because I was teaching so young, the boys used to behave as if I was a target for them. You know, they started to be disrespectful to me. Oh, how do you deal with that? There's one boy driving a bus up today, we're talking. I am 15, 4 this year. Only recently, actually, he started to hello again. I to take it to the principal, young boy. But he was as old as me or older, and I was teaching him. There is a little thing there, you know? There's a little thing there that, that just doesn't work out well. And if you don't have a strong principle and so on, you'll find that you, 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 you're in a difficult place to teach. I find that teachers must be trained before they go to the classroom. I look at them on Facebook. When I hear, that's my teacher, everything outside me. I said, that's your teacher for real? Like, you know, so young. So young, they look like from five. And they are teachers. I mean, could you blame them? But I blame them for Because I think, if you get a job and you are not capable of managing some size of it, the internet is so available. Learn how to manage your classroom, learn how to command respect, learn how to do some things because in my days when you had to get information, it's library for you, you know. Yeah. It's like opinion for all your what, what, what. And <laughs> you know, I look back at those days eh, and I say, oh, we have really come a long way, you know. And I'm not saying everything on the internet that is readily available and free is good, but you can do a, a meaningful search and find good information. I said, God bless YouTube. God bless Google. Because it has made life so much easier. Yeah. So, I mean, I want to encourage the young people to, to pray for the young teachers. I heard some talk recently, and somebody was saying the same thing, that they wish that we train our teachers before they send them to the classroom to teach. And I really hope that something happens where that is concerned. Because they have the same issues. I was hearing about the teacher who is engaged to avoid GSS. No, not GSS, I mean. Can't you see? So I said, is that a joke? Yeah. But when you check on the age of you, is a young teacher? So her boyfriend is still at TAMCC? And it might be something that you haven't really um, have given much thought. But I just find like, I just feel kind of odd. She's older, he's still in college. So this is 
something that um, when you get to school, try and understand that this is your reality. Pray and deal with it. And on top of that, on top of that, some of the content that, have been, that is being taught, these young teachers cannot teach them. They're not equipped. You're teaching French and your instruction in English is totally ungrammatical. You're not ready to teach French. You cannot give the instruction in English. So if you tell a child something in English to transform to French and your grammar is wrong, how would you get a French grammar right? Just think of it. I know what I'm talking about there. Eh? I'm such a child. I was also a journalist and in my very young days, when you see a new project and I understand, I just can't say exactly what it's <laughs> the Prime Minister said today that so and so and so and so and so and so and I put him on. Well, la 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 and he says this thing and story done. There is no interpretation because I don't understand what I said. <laughs> but I got a little smarter. I learned what to understand about you. I learned that when he spoke, I can get someone who can interpret the budget for me. And say, so, well, you know what he says here? This is what it means, and this is what he told you to roll out in the in the, in the economy. So that is the thing I find is a problem. When we don't know, even if information is so easy to come by, we don't spend the time to guess or to ask around and get the information. I always say to you, anything I'm doing, if I don't know, I know somebody who knows. I will ask them. And that is the kind of thing God has, God, 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 God admires that one. God wants us to be knowledgeable. He wants us to be excellent. In fact, he says in scripture that we are, we are blessed with all knowledge and all utterance. Excellency of knowledge and utterance. He has given us that. Do you understand the things that God has given to you and the things you still have to Acquire. Do you understand the difference? There are some things that God says for us already, yeah? but we're still trying to get it. If He says it's ours, it's ours. If you are blessed with all knowledge and, and all utterance, the excellency of it is on us, we don't have to ask Him not to give us. What you have to do is just thank Him for having given us and walk in it. Even when you don't feel married, some of you married. You know, it's not about what we feel because how we feel, feelings are so untrustworthy. You get up this morning and you just feel you will have a problem. You get up this morning and you just feel as if you will just, whatever it is. Don't trust your feelings. They are not reliable. Trust the word. It's true. Amen. So I want to share a little bit of the law of the mind. So we spoke about this gentleman who started this um, tower. And the Lord, I found that language very interesting. He came down. And he sees everything. He knows everything. Yeah. He came down to see the tower which they had built. You know, many times I read that scripture, I don't know what was wrong with my but I was thinking, he came by the whole building. It's not true enough. He came when it was finished. I always thought that after he came, and he confirmed with them and so on, they just couldn't continue. The thing was done. And by the way, as I'm saying that, I want to pray to you that the spirit of error in learning and teaching, all those facilitators of false teaching and learning, be demolished in your lives in the name of Jesus. Amen. We have learned a lot of things that are not true. We don't know where we learned them, and we stuck with them. And they were erroneous, and we lived with them for years and years and years and years. I know because it happened to me. So I pray that for you to me. I continue to ask God to just demolish all those things in your life that prevent you from seeing and learning accurately. So, I thought of what happens with our minds when we put it to the things that we have to do? Just as in our, we get to accomplish a lot without God, but we cannot accomplish what we truly.
truly should, because that is partial and mercy. Remember what um, David did with Goliath? You know, before David really delivered that that stone to Goliath's forehead, then, I mean, that was just the first that he was right there. Yes. But before that even happened, David had taken him down already psychologically. Psychologically, he had won that battle. Goliath thought he could talk and talk about what you come to me with sticks and with stones as if I'm a dog. What to David say, You think I'm a dog? You say that what to David. But um, David said, uh -uh, You are the ones the boys going to eat to me. You are the one. You. They say Christians are not supposed to say to you. Watch. I'm just urging you to live life in context. Live life in context. There's a time to pull on them things. There's a time to say what you have to say. Amen. And there's a time to be quiet. Amen. I know that even for women, pastors and so will tell you, a woman is supposed to be quiet. A woman is supposed to be all those things that I'm not. You know? Not that you're you know, easy and you're rambunctious or anything. It's just that, um, for example, confrontation. People will say, don't be confrontational as a Christian. Well, what is confrontational? If my friend, something has happened and I don't understand, or a member of here and I'm a member, and I say, sister so-and-so, so how so, I hear you say so-and-so, -and -so, is that true or is it not? That's confusion, that's free. Well, I think God is confrontational. He said, if you come to offer your gift, and your brother, your phone not out against you, you did something that make you whatever. He said, put on the thing. Put it down. Go. What do you call that? That is confrontation. That is not confusion. I think we have mixed up confrontation and confusion. And he wants us to confront things. Because when we don't, we become suspicious. We draw all kind of wrong conclusions. I think what is bad is when we go and we cause trouble. You know? So the next time somebody tells you you are confrontational, just make sure you're not guilty of the confusion cup and say, yeah, that's true. It's not wrong. It's what comes on top of that could be wrong. But it is not wrong to I like to confront this. But except God say, watch. Leave that alone. Sometimes he wants you to leave it alone too. And when he says leave it alone, by all means, leave it alone. So I want to say, I told you to leave it. So you leave it alone. But as far as it is in your, your heart to deal with issues, you see how this thing makes you sad? Sometimes something happens with you and your friend and you see what your relationship is you know. Because you can't raise the topic and you're just suffering. And everything that person does puts you more and more and more and more and more. Whereas you could have just dealt with it and everything just picks up and moving on again. I think that, I don't know, but I think people and kids and not young people, that is something you must try. I think it takes more effort to lie, to make up a story, than to come and say, look, like my mom told me yesterday, she has this guy who always comes and sit and chat with her in her shop and she say, oh, it's so my radio. So I say, you're asking for it? She say, no, but people tell me they're seeing playing it. So I say, when you listen to me, I say, boy, that radio had inside it. You take it? So she and him are talking now. They're vets. And she has never asked him one day if he has the radio. Now he might tell me no, and he has it. But at least I do what I have to do. And if you do something wrong to me, you are more disingenuous when you do something wrong and standing by the wrong than when you just come out and say it. It's true, I mean, I did that and I mean, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm really sorry. Who would rest with you after that? Who would rest? I mean, just think about it. What else can you do? Is it that you fix or you mash up? What you do, you, you know you did what you what you had to do. And to me, I honor a person much more if they tell me a hard truth than they lie to me and send me down a wrong way. I find it's the best thing to do to preserve your honor. I pray that you did something 
and take responsibility for it. Because everything you do will carry, you know, your your your, your consequences, being small of it. But it is the best way to do it. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Train your mind to perform according to instruction. If you repeat your imagination, you draw either spirits of God or demons based on what you think. So if you're thinking good thoughts, you will have the help of spirits from God to help you. If you're thinking wicked thoughts, you will have the assistance of the demonic forces to help you. So you draw those helpers from either side based on what your thoughts are. Your thought life is an important thing, you know. What happened to Job? Job, I mean, God says he was perfect. But Job had a mindset. Let me offer that thing before the children do something wrong and, and, and they have to face the wrath about Let me offer this thing for them. He was doing that all the time. It was a mindset that he could either bribe God by doing this, or what I found very, very interesting, and I found it of him this year. He said, I was not quiet, I was not at ease, and yet trouble came. He was not in safety, as the Persians also say, and yet trouble came. I realized something. Job did not know he was hedging it. Because he was safe. He said he was not in safety and yet trouble came. Job had his hedge, as you know. And his hedge had to be removed for Satan to get an opportunity to test him. But Job did not seem to be aware that he was hedged. Be careful to know what God has done for you. Be careful to be aware of what he has done for you. Job said he had no rest. You know, I'll tell you, this is a very interesting time for me. I have read that scripture again. When Thomas was sick, I read Job again and again and again. Because I'm 50, 10 more children and 140 years and double from the trouble. He was not to be. He has a different reality for me. But I did not see that Job was not that he Job was restless, all the sacrifices, sacrificing. And all the things he was doing. Job had no peace. I did not see that. He says he was not quiet. He didn't feel safe. And that is also, even if God allows Satan to tempt and try him, Job also had a goal. So God will kill you because you have a goal, but you have to pray and ask him to shut the doors that you ought not to have open. Because they can lead to your to real pain. So when I learned that Job did not realize he was actually in a shop. But remember, Job didn't have a Bible and think that we have more. He was living by faith. You still have to live by faith. So you are truly defeated when your mind does not capture victory. And those spirits partner with your mindset. And what happens? That is called a stronghold. Your mindset is a stronghold. And that is why I kind of changed them. Um, Topic because I felt we had to deal with the strongholds strong that we set us and what they are and the importance of pulling them. You know, you know, the scripture never says cast out the stronghold. You have to pull it on. You cast out demons, but you pull out strongholds. A stronghold is a sustained faulty pattern of thinking based on lies and deception, often imposed by the mind. Raw mindsets or ideology or value system or ways of thinking, whatever you want to call them. That is what a stronghold is. And demons can fortify a mindset. Some people say, I've got a particular girl. I was not told me, she said, Me, who came a walking man and has just get like that? These are the demons. If you're walking around for too long, it's like What do you think that is? It's a stronghold, it's a mindset. It's a mindset. And if you keep saying this thing, it 
becomes a part of you, I'm not going to happen, the natural thing is going to take its course. It's going to happen again. It will happen again because you tell yourself, I can control that. Once you walk together for a little while, that happens. So in order for you to get different results, you have to change your mindset. And that is where you have to pull down strong roots. So, demons fortify your mindset and use it as a gateway into a person's life. And it becomes a stronghold to ensure that a person consistently thinks a certain way. Are there things that you think a certain way about all the time? Me? If I go in the sea, I'm drunk. You know, and you go to the sea and you're seeing the worst things in your mind's eye. You're rolling down under the water and the billows over you like I'm Jonah. And you think that every time. Eventually, one day when the water is you, that might be it. Eh? Serious, that might be it. Because these are the spirits that work with you to make sure that it happens. You might go in get a crown or whatever, whatever. That can happen, especially to unbelievers. It's not covering. So Satan can navigate many pathways to access a believer's life. Mindsets permit the operation of the Holy Spirit or demon spirits in the life of a man. The quality of a man's life revolves around his mindset. It determines our limits. Words are products of ideology. When we speak of what we believe and what we think, they said, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Can he give bread also? Remember the Israelites in the desert? They limited God. They said, well, God is all powerful until He meets your mindset. I sometimes look at the scripture and say, wow, do you limit God? We can. So let's just quickly look at sources of mindsets. Culture. I'm a Christian. I enjoy the nice music and the the, the costuming and so on of carnival. So I don't believe in anything else about carnival, but I would shit in the nice costumes and so on and so on. Carnival has a god. There is a god of carnival, many gods. One is called Bacchus, from we did Bacchanal, god of wine, god of revelry, and there are other gods. Every time you jump and wave, just as for you jump here and wave for your god, he said jump and wave for the god of this world. Culture. When I was writing a book with my husband about the believer's language, I read a book written by Carmen Bellino. She is um, from Carmen. She wrote a book, book about Carmen, Carmen and festivals. One of the things she spoke about is the, the big drum dancing and what it does. And she said, do you remember my name? Anyway, she said that they form a circle and they do the dancing thing, the big drum is beating, and they create a space in the circle. And they pour alcohol, there's a name for that, I can't remember it. They pour alcohol and they do incantations so that the spirit of the ancestors can come in the space that is left in the circle of the big drum. And sit down and say this is culture. It is demonology. It is not culture. And I'm not saying you take body caribou. I'm just saying, don't be drawn into that satanic mindset that what you think is culture. It is not culture. Culture is a very interesting thing, I find, that the devil has used over the ages to bring us his gifts well package. So much of what is satanic is in our culture. So where culture disconnects with scripture, it is time to disconnect with culture. Because yes. so some culture is it's okay. A lot of it is not okay. Past experience also creates a mindset. A person who is molested, for example, might never be able to maybe have a husband because you see all men as wicked devils. 
So that mindset now has to be changed. That mindset has to be pulled on. That's a strong way. We get mindsets too from association, who we associate with. All, all, all kinds of people come with what they come with. We also get it from family backgrounds. You grow up doing something in your family for years and years and years you're doing it, and you never even sat and figure out, is that thing right? Should I be doing this thing? And it stays in you, it's like it's me. Failures also create mindsets. You fail at something, and you don't ever want to try again because you think failure is a mark of incompetence. Failure says that you could never do anything right, and that is not true. That is not true. The Bible even says a righteous man might fall down seven times, but he gets up. So where you have experienced failure in your life, don't say that you've given up. That mindset will make sure you never try again, so you will never have success. Mindsets are not spirits and cannot be cast out. You can't say, I cast out this mindset. A stronghold is like a chain to keep men in bondage. You know, people say people um, sell the souls of men to the enemy. And that is true. But they also can sell your mind. Because if you come into the kingdom of darkness and you ask for influence, to get other men to come into the demonic kingdom. You are influencing the mind of others to serve the enemy. How many business people, for example, will contract with the enemy and they will be used to bring in other people into the kingdom of darkness? That happens. And their minds are totally engaged with the enemy. So let's look at a few things about how to pull them down up until the end. Recognize that you need help with a strong will. Recognize, watch, I had a strong will. I had a strong will in my life. I was afraid to drive a lot. I was meant to drive everywhere. One time we had two cars, but one time even twice, I didn't find the fish market and, and, and go home with him. Because I didn't want to drive. Left it in the fish market. And say, well, you know, I said, what are you doing? He said, what's your plan? I said, well, leave it for the night. But people don't leave their time in the fish market for the night. God just was most equal to me. Like, anybody could have read it. So, when I think I was driving sometimes when he was sick, I was just with the driver. I was just thinking, drive to the shop, be alone. I never thought I had fear in my life like that. I never thought I had such a fear because I felt generally I was kind of kind of strong. But that was a serious, serious fear I had. And I can't go. I think that's before I had accident or like that. I had an accident on my hill. With any other baby. I just came on top of the car. Thought I had a hand with God. I just went because um Thomas used to say all the time, when you come and pack it, take it the whole pack, you don't even go back for it. So I said, okay, let me come out and see that I have to. And I came out. And to my mind, my hand was up and I was in back. And I just looked at the step to see how close I was to it. And when I turned back, my car was going on my hill. And my little boy was in the driver's seat. Well, I jumped in. And I hit the gas. I only hear, bam, 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 going on. Hitting trees, breaking the window. Oh my God, I said, Jesus! <laughs> so, was up there. She was a baby, she was over six months in her car seat. And I think maybe that is really what gave me this fear of driving. So, I bought a new car. I'm coming out of that place on my way down. I read it, Matthew Paris. What a full focus there. I never tried to swim the whole life. I'm driving and my knees are just shaking, shaking, afraid to press everything. I kind of come out of the little um, big line by my tires. My knees just trembling, I wouldn't give any pressure on the accelerator. And someone's driving in front of me, I said, I can't do this. I said, you drive driving home. Richard, look up at the stop. My heart 
is just going, going, going. I said, I already can't make it. Sit it after rest, we're going home. <laughs> I was so careful that day. So careful that day. And I think that really, really, really made me a pretty great. So today, I'm not done. I mean, I still enjoy it also, I enjoy it. But I drive at will. I drive now, I can go, I can do my stuff, I can come back home, I can go out several times a day. I couldn't I could deal with that. That was a strong move. And the enemy was saying, You, you will never drive with you in any bed. Anytime you try to drive in, you will dead. I don't know what are your strongholds. I mean, I thank God I don't have a stronghold over me anymore. I don't let people I pray. I drive everywhere I want to go, except for where I'm here. <laughs> so, <laughs> I have a stronghold. Yeah, don't have to break, don't have to go. Stronghold, I pull it down, in Jesus' name. I am just saying that every time you look at you, you will see something that has to go. Don't make excuses. I tell you, I listened for years. Eh? The no driving thing was for years I had that stronghold. So look and see what it is you have that prevents you from achieving God's best for you. And I'm going to help you with some good things that you can do. So, you know how scripture says, He lights the light of every man that comes into the world. God has wired us all with an infinity for Him, a desire for Him. It is in it, it is in us. But of course, because we have will, a lot of people don't don't take him on with, with, with that thing and they, they, they also somebody else. But just as he lights the light of every man that comes into the world, Satan also looks for things that he can put in you. He puts something in you. He puts it like a program and sometimes he waits. He might put it in you since you're young. And as you grow older and older, you realize that there are some things in you that have been there and you have to do. Satan is very strategic. Eh? He's not smart, he's not wise, but he's very strategic. Because he knows, he knows stuff. He walked in God's presence. And you know, God is interested that his gifts and so are God's dependence. Eh? He doesn't take back what he really gives you. But you can corrupt what it gives you. That is why you could once be functioning in the prophetic, and then you turn, forget about God, and you're functioning in the demonic. It's the same gift. It's prophetic on the one side, it's demonic on the other side. So, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. That's just the English standard version. And take every thought captive to obey Christ. Could you imagine you are in a battle for your mind, you are in a battle for your thoughts. And he says, take every thought captive in order to obey God. So when the thought comes that tell you, do so and so and so, you take that thought and you say no. You say no, in the name of Jesus, I cause this thought to have no effect on me. I make my mind inhospitable, to the attack of the enemy, I cleanse my mind with the blood of Jesus and his word and his power. You have to take captive those thoughts that you are not to have. Weapons to pull them down destroy the programming. That's what you can also see. I destroy the programming you are putting in my mind in the name of Jesus. I pull it down. I pull down every demonic programming that has been put on my mind. I refuse to think the way you want me to think. I am not your candidate. I put it off the name of Jesus. These are not your things. We have to do it to preserve our minds. Every mindset responsible for the defeat in my life, I come against you. This is as you can see. Sometimes it comes from mother, I put it on. From father, I put it on. I rewrite my mind with the word and influence and supremacy of God in Jesus. Let us say this one. I rewire my mind. I rewire my mind with the word and influence. With the word and influence. And supremacy.
supremacy of God. In Jesus' name. Well, at this point, I want to say what they told me I should have said this start. Be safe, be focused, engage, and empowered in Christ. You cannot be empowered unless you have the knowledge. I hope that what I presented today made sense to you because I like practical Christianity. I like to know that I am being taught something I can do something about. I hope that the young ones who are looking for some change in their minds so that their behavior will change would have learned how to get rid of those stumbling blocks. The battle is for your mind. The battle is for your mind. Your mind is the battlefield. That is why sometimes the enemy will break the minds of some people. But we cause our minds to stay focused the Bible says, gird up the loins. You know your loins is your waist. The Bible says, gird up the loins of your, of your mind. Your mind has loins? He understands how important it is. I think the Bible says your mind, your loins is supposed to be gird with truth. It says, gird up the loins of your mind. Truth is an antidote for a broken mind. Is there anything that you'd like to ask? I thank you for your attention and um, these were not meant to just be notes, they were meant to be practical help for you. In